Hello, thank you so much for joining me. Linda Lamp here today to read to you A Course in Miracles from the main text. We're reading chapter 23, The War Against Yourself. And today we're going to read sections four, Salvation Without Compromise, and section five, Above the Battleground. Salvation Without Compromise. Is it not true you do not recognize some of the forms attack can make or take? If it is true attack in any form, if it is true attack in any form will hurt you and will do so just as much as in another form as you do recognize, then it must follow that you do not always recognize the source of pain. Attack in any form is equally destructive. Its purpose does not change. Its sole intent is murder, and what form of murder serves to cover the mass of guilt and frantic fear of punishment the murderer must feel? You may deny he is a murderer and justify his savagery with smiles as he attacks. Yet he will suffer and will look upon his intent in nightmares where the smiles are gone and where the purpose rises to meet his horrified awareness and pursue him still. For no one thinks of murder and escapes the guilt the thought entails. If the intent is death, what manner the form it takes, what matter the form it takes. Is death in any form, however lovely and charitable it may seem to be, a blessing and a sign the voice of God speaks through you to your brother? Wrapping does not make the gift you give. An empty box, however beautiful and gently given, still contains nothing. And neither the receiver nor the giver is long deceived. Withhold forgiveness from your brother and you attack him. You give him nothing and receive of him but what you gave. Salvation is no compromise of any kind. To compromise is to accept but part of what you want, to take a little and give up the rest. Salvation gives up nothing. It is complete for everyone. Let the idea of compromise but enter and the awareness of salvation's purpose is lost because it is not recognized. It is denied where compromise has been accepted, for compromise is the belief. Salvation is impossible. It would maintain you can attack a little, love a little, and know the difference. Thus, it would teach a little of the same can still be different, and yet the same maintain, in main, same remain intact as one. Does this make sense? Can it be understood? This course is easy just because it makes no compromise. I would argue with them that this course is not easy. Uh, because of the language, but anyway. Yet it seems difficult to throw to those who still believe that compromise is possible. They do not see that if it is, salvation is attack. Yet it is certain the belief that salvation is impossible cannot uphold a quiet, calm assurance it has come. Forgiveness cannot be withheld a little, nor is it possible to attack for this and love for that and understand forgiveness. Would you not want to recognize assault upon your peace in any form, if only thus does it become impossible that you lose sight of it? It can be kept shining before your vision, forever clear and never out of sight if you defend it not. Those who believe that peace can be defended and that attack is justified on its behalf, cannot perceive it lies within them, within them. How could they know? Could they accept forgiveness side by side with the belief that murder takes some forms by which their peace is saved? Would they be willing to accept the fact their savage purpose is directed against themselves? No one unites with enemies nor is at one with them in purpose. 
and no one compromises with an enemy, but hates him still for what he has kept from them. Mistake not truth for peace, nor compromise for the escape from conflict. To be released from conflict means that it is over. The door is open. You have left the battleground. You have not lingered there in cowering hope that it will not return because the guns are stilled an instant and the fear that haunts the place of death is not apparent. There is no safety in a battleground. You can look down on it in safety from above and not be touched, but from within it you can find no safety. Not one tree left still standing will shelter you. Not one illusion of protection stands against the faith in murder. Here stands the body torn between the natural desire to communicate and the unnatural desire, unnatural intent to murder and to die. Think you the form that murder takes can offer safety? Can guilt be absent from a battleground? I think I'll hold my comments to the end. Section five, above the battleground. Do not remain in conflict, for there is no war without attack. The fear of God is fear of life and not of death. Yet he remains the only place of safety. In him is no attack and no illusion in any form stalks heaven. Heaven is wholly true. No difference enters, and what is all the same cannot conflict. You are not asked to fight against your wish to murder, but you are asked to realize the form it takes conceals the same intent. And it is this you fear, not the form. What is not love is murder. What is not loving must be an attack. Every illusion is an assault on truth, and everyone does violence to the idea of love because it seems to be equal of, of equal truth. What can equal, be equal to the truth yet different? Murder and love are incompatible, yet if they are both true, then they must be the same and indistinguishable from one another. So will they be to those who see God's son, a body. For it is not the body that is like the son's creator. And what is lifeless cannot be the son of life. How can a body be extended to hold the universe? Can it create and be what it creates? And can it offer its creations all that it is and never suffer loss? God does not share his function with a body. He gave the function to create unto his son because it is his own. It is not sinful to believe the function of the son is murder but it is insanity. What is the same can have no different function. Creation is the means for God's extension, and what is his must be his son's as well. Either the father and the son are murderers, or neither is. Life makes not death, creating like itself. The lovely light of your relationship is like the love of God. It cannot yet assume the holy function God gave his son, for your forgiveness of your brother is not complete as yet, and so it cannot be extended to all creation. Each form of murder and attack that still attracts you and that you do not recognize for what it is limits the healing and miracles that you have the power to extend to all. That's like the most important sentence 
maybe in the whole book. I'll read it again to you. Each form of murder and attack that still attracts you and that you do not recognize for what it is limits the healing and miracles you have the power to extend to all. I'll come back to this for the discussion. Yet does the Holy Spirit understand how to increase your little gifts and make them mighty. Also, he understands how your relationship is raised above the battleground, in it no more. This is your part, to realize that murder in any form is not your will. The overlooking of the battleground is now your purpose. Be lifted up and from a higher place look down upon it, and from there will your perspective to be quite different. Here in the midst of it, it does seem real. Here you have chosen to be a part of it. Here murder is your choice. Yet from above, the choice is miracles instead of murder. And the perspective coming from this choice shows you the battle is not real and easily escaped. Bodies may battle, but the clash of forms is meaningless. And it is over when you realize it has never begun. How can a battle be perceived as nothingness when you engage in it? How can the truth of miracles be recognized if murder is your choice? When the temptation to attack rises to make your mind darkened and murderous, remember, you can see the battle from above. Even in forms you do not recognize the, form, the signs you know. There is a stab of pain, a twinge of guilt, and above all, a loss of peace. This you know well. When they occur, leave not your place on high, but quickly choose a miracle instead of murder. And God himself and all the lights of heaven will gently lean to you and hold you up. For you have chosen to remain where he would have you, and no illusion can attack the peace of God together with his son. See no one from the battleground, for there you look on him from nowhere. You have no reference point from where you look, where meaning can be given, what you see. For only bodies could attack and murder, and if, if this is your purpose, then you must be one with them. Only a purpose unifies, and those who share a purpose have a mind as one. Body has no purpose of itself and must be solitary. From below, it cannot be surmounted. From above, the limit it exerts on those in battle still are gone and not perceived. The body stands between the Father and heaven and the heaven he created for his son because it has no purpose. Think what is given those who share their father's purpose and who know that it is theirs. They want for nothing. Sorrow of any kind is inconceivable. Only the light they love is in awareness, and only love shines upon them forever. It is their past, their present, and their future, always the same, eternally complete and wholly shared. They know it is impossible their happiness could ever suffer change of any kind. Perhaps you think the battleground can offer something you can win. Can it be anything that offers you a perfect calmness and a sense of love so deep and quiet that no touch of doubt can ever mar your certainty? And that will last forever? Those with the strength of God in their awareness could never think of battle. What could they gain but loss of their perfection? For everything fought for on the battleground is of the body, something it seems to offer or to own. No one who knows that he has everything could seek for limitation nor could he value the body's offerings. 
The senselessness of conquest is quite apparent from the quiet sphere above the battleground. What can conflict with everything? And what is there that offers less yet could be wanted more? Who with the love of God upholding him could find the choice of miracles or murder hard to make? All right, let's talk about this in my language uh, in the hopes that it'll make it a little clearer. So let's come back to the understanding that everything that we see is an illusion, right? From a physics point of view, there really isn't anything out here. Sure, we see forms, we see other people, we, we see animals and trees, and yet it's all truly an illusion of our creation. It's a, an illusion of our eyes and of our mind. Because if you put anything that exists under a microscope, it all looks the same. It's all mostly space, very little matter, and what is there is in movement, is moving. And yet, when you look up and look around the room, unless there's other people in it or an animal, or you have a fan going or the wind is blowing, nothing is moving. Things are just static. The chair is the chair, the table is the table. They are not walking around the room. They are not moving. And yet, they are moving. There is movement. And they are mostly space. And yet, how can that be? And at, at some point, you just have to accept it. You just have to accept that that is the truth. And when you do accept that that is the truth, then a lot of this stuff starts to get a little easier to understand. The body has no purpose is not quite accurate. The body has purpose in that it is the container within which you reside. And that is so that you can experience this amazing illusion. And so what this chapter is talking about, this idea of murder, is any time, any time you have a feeling of disharmony about other people around you, or anywhere for that matter, you are lost, you're confused, you've forgotten. Whoever it is you might be holding anger or hatred for is divinity, just like you. They have a body, just like you. And something much grander is happening here. So, as we read through these chapters, we, we have to remember this information. And you have to run it through this continually. In order for it to make sense, or at least, you know, in order for it to make sense to me, that's what I have to do. So I suggest that maybe you try that. There was a place where I said I was going to come back to. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, chapter, or section rather. That's what it's talking about where it says, be lifted up and from a higher place look down upon it. You have to, if you're, if you're trying, if you're going to incorporate 
the wisdom that is here in this book and the other wisdom that I'm sharing. You're, you, you have to realize that most of, of what you've probably been told about how life works and other people and all of it has really been misleading. Most of what you know about reality is probably misleading. And here is the sentence that I came back, I wanted to come back to and, and read again. Each form of murder and attack that still attracts you and that you do not recognize for what it is limits the healing and miracles you have the power to extend to all. This is a critical, critical concept to grasp. Anytime you, you're feeling reactive to another person, anytime that you think that killing somebody would be the way to move through to progress or to a better world or to a better solution or that murder in any way. And then it isn't just murder. I mean, you could be much broader, any kind of punishment, any kind of, of uh, assault, physical or mental or spiritual. When they say that still attracts you, that, that means that it, it attracts you in a way that it's coming to your mind. Your mind is attracting it. Your mind attracts it. Your mind thinks of it as a solution. And what it's suggesting and what I will uh, suggest with it is that when you get to the place where you are living from your heart, and you've embraced your divinity, then none of those thoughts will even occur to you. They won't be, as they say here, attractive. They won't be at all. And, and the, the rest of it, the, the idea that there are limits to the healing and the miracles that you have to, the power to extend to all. This is true. So consider Yeshua, Jesus, as most people call him, consider him. And consider the amazing healing and miracles he had the power to create. He was here to convey that information and those teachings to all of us. Is there no wonder that he was killed? Is there no wonder that he was a threat to society? Because people who didn't understand the teachings, they understood one thing. That if he, what he was saying was true, that if everybody could have the healing power and the miracle power that he had, well, by golly, that would put some people out of business, wouldn't it? We can't have that. And that's what we're up against. We're up against an entire planet of capitalistic, asleep, policies. We don't need capitalism. We don't need any of those economic structures. We are miracles in and of ourselves, each and every one of us, and we have incredible power. It hasn't been taken away from us. It's been removed from our daily conversations. It's been removed from the public documents. It's been removed from common knowledge. Much of it is locked away in tombs somewhere, I suspect, along with lots of other artifacts that 
would reveal just too much to us, would make us uncontrollable. Now, you know, the, the thing is, is that there's some fear in a lot of people. Well, what happens if people learn their power and then they use it badly? That isn't how it works. You don't get to use your power badly. There are no devils, ultimately. Everything is divinity. Just keep coming back to that. Everything is divinity. Divinity in form, divinity in function. Maybe not appearances, but everything is divinity. So you don't have to be afraid of those things. We don't have to be afraid. There are no angry gods. It isn't how it works. And you being divinity will not in some way allow you to be abusive of your powers. It isn't how it works. Because if you're truly being divinity, your love, your love in form and function. And that's really what this is all about. This whole book is about us understanding that we are divinity in form and function and need to embrace that, live up to it, live up to it. So that's the end of that section and also chapter. The next reading we'll be starting will be chapter 24, the goal of specialness. Doesn't that sound interesting? And I'll give you a sneak preview. Section six in that chapter, the title is The Christ in You. I'm looking forward to getting to that chapter. So thank you again for joining me today. If you would like additional assistance with this or you'd like to chat about it, you can text me at 907-351-3003. Email questions at walkingthroughyourwalls.com. You can go to my website, lindalamp.com or lindalamp.shop. And I'll look forward to being with you next week as we pick up with chapter 24. Until then, namaste and much love. <laughs>